from book of Jonah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're, re we're just recording the uh, sermon, Bible reading and sermon. That's all. So, uh, so Chadwin will be reading Jonah chapter 1. Uh, it's actually verses 1 to 17. Thank you, Chadwin. Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and head to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a boat bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to, uh, to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to their own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm had come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord, has done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Thank you, Chadwin. Thanks for reading us God's word. Um, yeah, so uh, as you've heard, uh, we're looking at Jonah, uh, and we begin a new four-part preaching series on this book. And we're going to journey through the book chapter by chapter. And just at the beginning, I want to help us get into the, the mindset or the, the, the framework of Jonah. Uh, and I need to tell you that Jonah is a very fun and funny book. You might not think so, uh, but it is. And it's packed with twists and turns and lots of surprises and turbulence along the way. And just to get us in the, in the mood, in the frame, uh, we're going to play a short um, video, three minutes of uh, a reenactment, a Lego reenactment of the first two chapters of Jonah. So, uh, Clem, thanks if you can play that.
Okay, so there we have it. The word of the Lord according to Lego from the book of Jonah. Uh, it's obviously uh, uh, meant to be a funny uh, retelling of the first two chapters. We're only looking today at chapter one, which is... Uh, up to the point where Jonah gets swallowed up by the big fish. Um, and I guess if you know anything about the book of Jonah, that's probably the one thing you do know, right? It's, a, it's about a guy who gets swallowed by a big fish. And that's the thing that everyone remembers. Uh, and it makes for a great uh, Sunday school lesson. But what you might not know, and I've hinted at this already, is that the book of Jonah is kind of like uh, the dramatic dark comedy uh, of the Bible. You know, people often uh, rightly for many reasons, we, we're very serious when we read the Bible. Uh, you know, we, we get very solemn and stern. But this book is supposed to make you laugh or at least smile, at least smile, because uh, it's funny. It's both funny and pathetic. Uh, it's pathetic because the main character is such a pathetic prophet. He's a terrible missionary. Uh, he's so bad at it. Uh, he's so bad, he's actually pathetically funny at how bad he is. But ultimately, the book of Jonah, it's not about a big fish. Uh, it's not even really about Jonah at the heart of it. It's about our own sin and self-centeredness and about God's great grace and compassion for all people, especially for those people whom we don't think deserve God's grace and compassion. Okay, so let's dive in. So chapter one, verse one, we'll move through the story uh, fairly fast. Verse one, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh, preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, two things you need to know that makes, frames the story. It's like the backstory to Jonah. First of all, the name Jonah in Hebrew means dove, as in the bird, the dove. Um, and in the New Old Testament, uh, the symbol of a dove or the, the bird uh, is usually a good thing. So uh, when there's the, the big flood with Noah and Noah's in the ark, 40 days and 40 nights, uh, remember what bird comes uh, to tell Noah there is land? This bird flies to the ark with a, an olive branch, and it's a dove, a dove telling Noah that land there's land ahead and the flood is now over and he can land. So uh, the word dove is supposed to be a good thing. It's a messenger, the word, you know, like a messenger for God. And uh, Amittai is in Hebrew faithfulness. So here you have a guy whose name is Dove, son of faithfulness, son of Amittai. So it's, uh, it's quite the name. So you think with a name like this, surely it's going to be good. He's going to be a good prophet. He'll do the job well. Well, maybe not so much. So the word of the Lord comes to Dove, son of faithfulness, tells him to go to Nineveh, this great city, we're told, uh, but also a city that is wicked. Uh, there's a lot of evil in it, and he's supposed to go and preach against it. Now, Nineveh was the capital of this huge empire, the Assyrian Empire, 
And, and what you need to know about uh, the Assyrians, these guys were bad, really bad. Uh, they were the Nazi stormtroopers of the ancient world, merciless, murderers, genocidal. They chopped people's heads off for fun and piled them up uh, in, in piles to show uh, people how bad they were. The Assyrians would wipe out entire nations. Uh, a few years back, they had already smashed the northern kingdom of Israel. And Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. So uh, for Jonah, Nineveh was no ordinary place. Uh, it was a symbol of something bad and evil. And visiting Nineveh was not on Jonah's bucket list, for sure. So verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So here's uh, where uh, there's a bit of dark comedy. The Lord appears, gives Jonah a mission, a message. I want you to do this. And so you think that Jonah being uh, a faithful prophet, dove, a uh, symbol of being God's messenger, uh, you think he packs his bags, buys a ticket, and heads off to Nineveh to do God's will like a good, faithful, obedient prophet. And uh, you think, oh, hold on. Well, he bought a ticket for Tarshish. Okay, man, maybe Tarshish is not far from Nineveh. It's the nearest port. Maybe that's why he bought a ticket to this place called Tarshish. So just to check, you take out your phone, you uh, pull up Google Maps, you type in uh, Nineveh, you type in Tarshish, you hit enter, uh, ask for direct, you, you get your directions. And guess what? Tarshish is in the complete opposite direction to Nineveh. You couldn't get furthest from Nineveh if you tried. Uh, so God basically told Jonah, get up and go east to Nineveh. Jonah gets up and goes west. It's like uh, uh, saying, go to Sydney, and Jonah gets up and goes to Perth. Um, so... Jonah is not actually much of a prophet or a messenger. He's, he's completely going AWOL on God and on his mission. But you think, well, maybe there's a good reason. I mean, if Nineveh is such a horrible place, uh, such an evil place, then maybe that's why he's so afraid. Well, we're not told here why uh, Jonah refuses to go to Nineveh. Later on, we're told. Um, but uh, here, he just refuses and goes the other way. Jonah is not happy with the mission God's given him. He's not going to do it. He doesn't agree with it, and he thinks he knows best. Now, this is not uh, anything new. Uh, in the Old Testament, there's other people who responded to God's calling on their lives, to his will for them uh, in similar ways. So with Moses, remember Moses, when he was told to go and rescue Israel from Egypt, uh, he offers all these lame excuses to God um, uh, even though God's speaking to him out of a flaming bush, and you think you probably should listen to God if you know he can do this with fire. But uh, Moses is, tries to excuse himself. Uh, then Isaiah, when Isaiah is given his mission, his commission, uh, he says he's too sinful uh, to do this. Uh, and, and just as much these people that God wants Isaiah to go to anyway, they're horrible sinners, so why should he go? Uh, Jeremiah also uh, said to God, I, I can't do this, God. I'm too young. But eventually, all of these three guys, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, did what God asked them to do. But Jonah, no, he not only doesn't he refuse, he doesn't even say a word. He just runs. He, he sprints for it, running from responsibility, running from his mission, and more tragically, running from God. But as we read on, it's obvious that uh, God doesn't tend to give up on his plans, on his good plans for people. He doesn't give up on his servants, his messengers, or on his plans. And so in verse, verse 4, God sends this huge storm at the sea, uh, and it looks like the ship that Jonah is on, headed for Tarshish, is about to, to break up, right? It's about to split open. Uh, the sailors on the ship begin to do whatever they can to save the boat. Uh, first, they cried out to God. Uh, to their many gods, because they're pagans, they're not uh, uh, faithful 
Jewish people, the pagans, but at least they're crying out to their gods for help. Uh, they're trying to ask their gods to save them, which is the thing that Jonah should have done, right? He should have done that from the beginning. He should have been talking to God, asking for God's help. Uh, so that the sailors throw stuff overboard, nothing works. And meanwhile, Jonah is uh, doing something which I, I like, uh, taking a nap. He's sleeping. Uh, I'm all for naps. I believe in napping. Uh, but there's a time and a place for naps. And this is not the time or the place, right? This is not it. So then uh, the sailors are terrified. The captain rushes down, uh, wakes Jonah up and uh, says, how can you be sleeping? Wake up, call upon your God. We're doing it. You should be doing it too. Perhaps your God will save us. Uh, this is this is good. It's good, uh, good religion to ask Jonah to speak to his God, to ask his God for help, to call out to the source of help. And you would have thought that Jonah might have responded, but no, nothing. Jonah is silent. Okay, let's jump back into the story. Verse 7, then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who's responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What's your country? From what people are you? So the sailors have gone back up to the deck. They throw the dice. They flip the coin. And surprise, surprise, it's Jonah. It's his fault. And then you see this incredible thing where there's a storm. The waves are crashing on the boat. And the sailors, instead of just picking up Jonah and throwing him overboard, they, they ask him questions. They want to know. They want some information from this guilty, hopeless prophet. You think they would just have just grabbed him and throw him overboard to save their lives. But these pagan sailors are actually uh, better people than Jonah. They have more character than Jonah, than the great prophet. They're actually quite remarkable. Instead of getting rid of Jonah, they ask him for information. Tell us whose fault is it? Obviously, they know, but they just want to hear it from him. And then they ask him other questions. What do you do? Where you come from? What's your country? Who are your people? And verse 9, Jonah kind of answers, doesn't he? The great prophet of God, finally, after all his silence and running away and his fearful uh, responses, his napping, he finally opens his mouth. Not because he wants to, because he has to. He's been caught red-handed by these desperate sailors. So verse 9, Jonah answers, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. It's, it's quite the, uh, the statement of faith, right? It's a good statement of faith, a good uh, faith confession. Uh, and it kind of answers the sailors' questions, but not, not fully. Uh, but the one thing it shows you, if you look at it closely, what he says, it shows you how easy it is to say you believe something and then to do the complete opposite, right? Jonah says he fears God, the God who made heaven and earth and the sea and the dry land. And yet, He's fleeing from this God on the sea that God who made the sea made. So Jonah is fleeing God on the very sea that God supposedly made. It makes you wonder whether Jonah actually believes what he says he believes, right? And, you know, I guess you and I would never do that. We never be like that. You know, we would never say we believe one thing and do the opposite, right? Oh, yeah, sure. I believe in God who's in charge of everything and, and loves me, but I'm not sure if I can trust him to see me through this challenge in my family or at work or with my studies. How often do we find ourselves doing just that? Well, Jonah might not believe what he says, uh, but the sailors certainly do. These pagan sailors, they immediately believe him. They fear, the fear they felt at the storm is now nothing in comparison to the fear they feel, knowing uh, that it's the God of Jonah 
who is coming after Jonah and has sent the storm. So they believe him uh, and they get they realize that the storm is God's way of catching up with Jonah. And the situation needs a quick fix. Um, so grab Jonah, tie him up, drop him over the side. Problem fixed. But no, not these sailors. These guys have character. These guys are remarkable. Verse 10, this terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea come down for us? These guys really are much, much better people than Jonah. Uh, they asked Jonah, what do you think we should do? Jonah's answer, verse 12, pick me up, throw me in the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Finally, finally, it sounds like, it seems like Jonah has come to his senses. That maybe Jonah's repented. He has seen the error of his ways. Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, why is he now showing concern for these sailors when he showed so little before? It could be just as well that he just wants to die. And he wants to just get away from God for good. He couldn't get away from God on dry land, on the sea. Maybe he can get away from God under the sea in death. Maybe by dying, he can escape from God. The ultimate way to run away from God. And why not ask the sailors to do it? Then Jonah will have no responsibility at all, either for his life or for his death. So let's... Uh, Let's keep going. Verse 13. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. These sailors are hard to escape. They will not give up. They won't give up on Jonah, even though Jonah has given up on them and on God and on himself. So they row to save the ship and to save Jonah. But it's not good. The storm just gets worse and worse. Finally, the sailors pray this wonderful prayer, verse 14, a prayer to the God that Jonah has just introduced him to, introduced them to. It's very ironic, isn't it? Jonah did not want to be a missionary. He did not want to preach the news of God's grace and compassion. And yet here he is against his will, converting other people, telling other people about his God, a God who's merciful. So verse 14. The sailors cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. You see that they know they have no choice but to throw Jonah overboard, but they don't want to do it. They prefer to avoid it if they could. So they beg God, they pray to him to not hold them guilty for his death. Uh, they did their very best. I mean, what, what more could you ask them? They did everything they could to save him. So then verse 15, then they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. So the sailors throw Jonah overboard. The sea is quiet, and uh, the sailors are in awe of Jonah's God, and so they offer a sacrifice. The thing the prophet should have done, the thing Jonah ought to have done, they do instead. They sacrifice to God right there on the deck of their ship, and they make vows of loyalty and covenant to the God of heaven and of the sea. The thing Jonah should have done and didn't, they do. So who's the true servant of God? Who's the true faithful people? Not Jonah, that's for sure. So as the smoke of the sacrifice goes up into the sky, Jonah drops like a stone into the depths of the sea and the sun begins to shine over the calm waters. But if Jonah thinks he's going to escape from God, he's got another thing coming, right? Uh, verse 17, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So, 
there ends uh, chapter one, and it's been quite the story, quite a breathless, uh, fast-moving narrative. But um, we uh, don't live in that world, obviously. Um, but what can we learn today, 21st century uh, Sydney ciders? What can we learn from this story about us? Well, you know, friends, the more I thought about Jonah running away from God, the more I started thinking about myself and how I run away from God, or at least how I try to run away from God. And I started thinking about why anyone runs away from God. And more so, where do we run to? Where do I run to? Where do you run to when you run away from God? Because the truth is, I hope I don't have to convince you of this. We all run away from God. Sometimes, often, sooner or later, we all run from God and from God's will for our lives. Running away from God's purposes, his good purposes for us. Running away from doing what we know he wants us to do. Okay, you might say, well, I don't really run away from God. Okay, then how about hiding from God, ignoring God, um, trying to avoid God and his will. We all do it, running, hiding, avoiding, ignoring. So the question is this morning, where do you run to when you run away from God? When you try to get away from him, where do we go to when we try to escape and hide from God, when we try to ignore him and avoid him? Now, it's uh, obviously very – it doesn't happen often that we physically run away from God. So if he said to you tomorrow – go uh, on mission to China and you take off to Saudi Arabia or, or Europe, wherever. Uh, that's not usually how it goes, uh, and especially during a pandemic. No one's running away physically from God anyway. But we run from God. We hide from him. We try to ignore him uh, in all kinds of ways. For some of us, it's, it's pretty obvious. It's uh, relationships, socializing, parties, romance, sex, we desperately spend our days and hours looking for other people to give us a sense of connection, of pleasure, hoping to feel alive, to feel validated, to feel special, important, even if it's only for just a little while. We use people to escape God and what we know he wants us to do. For many guys, uh, it's pornography. Many guys use pornography to try and escape, run away from God. Other people use other addictions and uh, fixations to run away from God. Uh, and yet for others, it's not so obvious. It's a lot more respectable, a lot more subtle how we run away from God. Uh, we're just busy, busyness. We're just so, so busy doing many important and good things. I mean, how often... Have you said this to people? Yes, I'm busy. I'm really, really busy all the time. I don't have time for anything. We have great careers, great jobs, and they're all consuming. Um, if that's not the reason, then there's many other things we use to fill our days with all kinds of hobbies, pastimes, social media, Netflix, TV. We choke our lives with commitments with entertainments, uh, things which are in and of themselves mostly good. But when you get underneath all of that, you see it's just a smoke screen. It's just a, a smoke screen for running from God. And busyness is so deceptive, isn't it? Uh, we just keep doing more stuff and more and more and more, never actually stopping, stopping to check where God is in our lives and whether we're responding to him and what you know he wants for your life. So can I ask you this morning to please don't waste this lockdown. Don't waste these weeks. As difficult as they are, God is at work in them and through them in you and in me. Don't waste this opportunity to take a long, hard look at your life. And the way in which you keep running from what God wants you to do, from his will for your life. And then after you take a long, honest, hard look at your life, stop running. Try that. Stop running. And start listening to God 
and working on responding to him and what he wants for you. Ultimately, though, uh, the book of Jonah at its deepest core, at its heart, uh, Jonah points us beyond himself and beyond us to someone else. Jonah is a sign, a pointer to someone better who comes later. I mean, think about Jonah's story, right? Here's someone sent to speak the message of God's grace and compassion to evil people who did not want to hear it. And he says, no, he runs away. He's supposed to identify himself as God's messenger. He's God's prophet, God's missionary, and carry out his job. He doesn't. He's supposed to sacrifice himself for others, for the good of other people, but he doesn't. If only, if only there was someone who'd be sent by God to speak the good news of God's grace and compassion to people who hate him, to people who don't want him, and actually did it. If only there was someone who put being God's servant, God's missionary above everything else, even his own self-preservation. If only there was someone who would sacrifice himself for others rather than having them sacrifice themselves for him. Who could that be? I'm sure you know. Because there was someone, wasn't there? 600 years later, that someone comes along in the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament, uh, chapter 12, 38 to 41. Jesus is having a conversation. Jesus of Nazareth is having a conversation with a group of Jewish religious leaders. And these religious leaders They've heard Jesus teaching. They've seen him do some miracles. But they say, come on, Jesus, do something huge, something epic, something really big. Then we might start thinking about believing in you. And Jesus' answer is really interesting in Matthew 12. He says, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. A sign will be given. And out of all the Old Testament stories, he picks Jonah. He says, I'll give you the sign of Jonah. Just like Jonah spent three days and nights in the belly of the big fish, so he, Jesus, will spend three days and nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, he'll be dead. But he limits his death to three days and nights, meaning it's not going to last. Just as Jonah got out of the big fish alive, so too. Jesus will return to life as well. Of course, we know Jesus is speaking of himself, his death, his resurrection. So he says to the religious leaders, I'll give you a sign. I'll give you a sign so big you won't believe it. You won't be able to handle it. And so Jesus, for three days and nights, was in the heart of the earth. But just like Jonah came back, so did he, didn't he? The Jonah story was really about Jesus all along. So when you and I place our trust in Jesus, we place our trust on the one who truly, fully fulfills God's good purposes, God's will. You and I who spend our lives running away from God and ignoring his will by faith on the one who lived, died, and came back to life as the true faithful servant of God. By faith, we have forgiveness and life. The one who never ran away from God, but towards him. The one who gives us life and offers us God's grace and compassion. So may we always look to him. May we always look to him, to trust him, and to commit ourselves to imitate his faithfulness, his desire for God and God's will. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he did your will. He did what you asked him to do. He carried out your good purposes, bringing your grace and compassion to people like us, people who did not deserve any of it. Thank you, Father, that we have been given your forgiveness, your love, your grace, your compassion in Jesus. Thank you that uh, he is the true prophet, the true missionary, the faithful one. And when we place our trust, our faith in him, we are given your life 
your forgiveness and your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.